Hi everyone, uh, it's Muslim here. We're just waiting for a couple more people to come through the door. Um, we are going to be starting very soon, so just be a bit patient and we'll be able to get on with things. Um, now, obviously, we've just had one message about how someone is going on with their day. Can everyone else drop a message of how your day has been, what you guys have been up to, um, and anything you're excited to talk about in this event? I wonder, does anybody here already know much about Net Carbon Zero or like why people joined? I'm kind of interested. Yeah, yeah, same thing, yeah. And also feel free to drop in the chat where you guys are from and how you heard about this event. You know, we'd love to know whether you're from London or for, from any other part of England or whether you're from somewhere outside of the UK. It'd be nice to, to know where you guys are from. So drop it in the chat as well and let us know how you're doing, how your day's been. And uh, we'll be starting very, very soon. Yeah, that's important, especially what part of London people are from, because I'm going to be real. Up until this year, I'm not going to lie, I don't think I knew anybody from outside of London, but this year... I don't know if it's because of Zoom or just me starting my entrepreneurship career. I've been meeting loads of people from Birmingham, Manchester, Lincolnshire, Leicester. So it'll be great to see and hear what areas people are from in the UK. Because I, I'm not going to lie, I used to think, you know what, London is the city. London is the best city. I used to generally think that. And when I go on articles online and see that people would say London is the number one tourist attraction. I, if that used to massage my ego. I'd be like, yeah, that's my, that's my city. But still, other cities are amazing too. So it'll be great to hear where people are from too. London is not England. You have to remember that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. I think people get carried away. They think like London. When when people think of the when people outside of the UK think of the UK, they immediately think of London and Buckingham Palace and think that that represents Britain but honestly it's a lot more than that and there's a lot of other cities that have their own culture and their own history which is just as important to to talk to talk about but I can see here someone is watching from Tottenham um, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been having a very chill day we've had a chill day too um, we've you know we've been preparing for this for a very long time and you know we can't wait to tell you all about the things that we've been doing um, as well as you know tell you guys about you know net carbon zero and uh, get the discussion going so yeah. um if anyone else wants to message on the chat you know we're more than happy to read it out and um you can let us know how your day's been going and what you guys are excited to learn about and to hear from us yeah but i'm seeing karen in the chat that like you're from tottenham and look i'm an <laughs> arsenal fan so we all know that arsenal and tottenham they don't get on so karen i, I want to hear from you what football team do you support because I know some Tottenham people that support Arsenal. Oh, I hope no, you're no, one of those Tottenham, Tottenham, Tottenham people that Arsenal. support Arsenal. No one in Tottenham supports um, Tottenham. You know, the funny no, thing is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Chelsea fan. I'm a Chelsea fan. So you got, I'm a Chelsea fan. So right. you got Chelsea, you got, you got Tottenham. Oh, she's Man United. That can slide. Oh, that can slide. <laughs> well, let's go back. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> That was a start, wasn't it? And England are already playing, I think. So I think we're fighting for a, a competition tonight for, for people joining. Um, so hello, I'm, I'm Anna Rank and I just wanted to really give a, a quick introduction this evening. I'm a creative producer at Field and Clay Bradley Studios. And I'm not gonna take up a lot of time because I wanna hand over to these guys who are already flying. But I just wanted to set the scene a bit about what's happening tonight. So um, a few months ago, we joined forces is with design practice um, Thomas Matthews to create an installation for the London Festival of Architecture, which is still going on at the minute. Um, and we wanted to try and help the average person on the street understand what net zero carbon actually means. Mm. And this came off the back of a statistic that we'd come across that said that 64% of the UK public is unaware of net zero as a concept. And this is at a time when everyone you come across from pop star to politicians, from multinationals mm. to startups is talking about their route to net zero. And it seems really crucial to us <clears throat> that the general public understand what that means so that we can all understand what our collective role is in reaching it and we can collectively make informed choices about how we live our lives. So you saw some, <clears throat> some photos at the beginning of the event um, of that installation, which is in our London studio, and I'll send some links to that in the chat. Um, it's in the window, so anybody can see it when they're walking past, so do go down and check it out. Um, but that was kind of the starting point for the project, which is the reason why we're here today. And um, that was 
because we as a practice wanted to step slightly out of our comfort zone and engage with a completely different audience um and uh sorry i've just been spotlighted which has thrown me um so we collaborated with the brilliant neil onions from uh, social enterprise beyond the box to bring together a group of uh talented young content producers from across london and these five content producers who you've been hearing talking a bit already and you'll meet properly in a minute, were given a brief. And that was to take the information and the content from that installation and create their own content um, to communicate with their peers, other young people about what net zero carbon actually means. And they've been working incredibly hard over the last eight weeks uh, on a response to that brief. And they're gonna talk to you a bit about that. Um, so I'll leave that to them. But I just wanted to say a really big thank you to them all for all their work and all the commitment that they've put into this project. It's been a fantastic experience for us as a practice. It's been a huge learning experience for us as well. And I also just wanted to thank Neil um, for all his hard work behind the scenes. He does some incredible work with young people. Um, and I don't know how many people know about Beyond the Box, but if you don't, then I uh, recommend that you go and check them out. So that's enough from me. I am now going to hand over to our panel for this evening. So Jonas and Musin, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the amazing introduction. Everybody, welcome to the event. What is Net Carbon? Engaging young people in debunk debunking the mystery. I'm excited for this event because we've been thinking about this, as Anna said, for a while now. However, the day is finally here. And I'm here today with an amazing co-host. And trust me, I am... <laughs> privileged to be co-hosting this event with this young man because he's a legend and I know I'm calling him a young man when he's older than me but still he's amazing I'm going to let him introduce himself before we go to the panel and we explain what the background for the project really was so Mushin please tell the people the amazing stuff that you do for us. From one legend to another legend <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself I mean what an introduction um, Jonas uh, I mean we're, we're definitely go, going to go back to you because you're already the legend so we need to an introduction from yourself but uh, in terms of myself I'm currently the deputy young mayor for Tower Hamlet I'm a podcaster filmmaker and uh, and I, my podcast has been nominated for a BBC YR award and I've also worked with ITV Daily Mirror and a few other organizations um, I'm going to be obviously co-hosting this with Jonas and we've got a lovely panel which we're going to turn to in a few seconds but um, let's switch it back to Jonas. Jonas do you want to introduce yourself and tell the audience about what you're about and what you do? Yeah thank you Mission. so yeah my name is Jonas Andrew Phillip I'm a 19 year old international speaker, workshop facilitator and event host who also does blogs or podcasts various stuff like that just to ensure that I'm fulfilling my personal mission statement which is to be able to change the world for the better while staying humble and being and having fun also and also giving back to my, my community. And this aspect of what I do has really been something that I feel that I've been able to take pride in. And I, I'm sure that all the amazing panelists can agree too, because the main focus of this event is to really share our experience on the project and with the journey that we've gone on from the point where we started, where we did, actually, if you guys remember, we did a carbon calculator. And I feel most of us were quite shocked with what our score was. I know I was personally, because I thought, no, I'm, I'm good when it comes to this stuff. My carbon footprint isn't that bad. But then when I saw my, my score was a bit high, I was like, oh, Jonas, you might have to take some inventory on that and really look at what you're doing when it comes to this stuff. But just so everybody knows about the project as well, the background for this project is that we were assigned the task to create content regarding net carbon zero. And we tackled this through various methods. So podcasting, vox pox, quotes, little clips, there's various things that we've been doing. And we're gonna talk about that now because everyone in the group has brought amazing value to this and we're extremely excited to be talking to you guys right now. Now, before I get everyone to introduce themselves, I'm just gonna go over some ground rules. So this isn't anything to say, oh yeah, this, that and the other. I'm not a teacher or anything. Mush is not a teacher or anything. But what we wanna say is that there is a question function in the chat down below. So if you have a QA and a for later on when we do a QA and a for you guys, the audience, feel free to ask your questions. This is all about you guys too. And the event is being recorded if you couldn't tell already. So just be mindful of that also. And the content that's been created by the group will be discussed here. And it is also on the Net Zero website. The link is going to be in the chat and is going to post it. But yeah, that's all we have to say on the ground rules. But now I want to open up and let's start off with Shurin. Could you please give 
the audience an introduction about yourself and the amazing work that you do. Thank you, Jonas. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good evening. Uh, yeah, my name is Shirin Naveed, and I'm currently studying architecture at the University of Greenwich, going to my final year, um, but also working as an artist per se, I've recently been awarded tra uh, UCL Trellis Programme funding um, with, yeah, I guess, moving back from, like into the arts, like, uh, yeah, I have, an, I have a background in the arts, moving back into that, um, with it being informed by architecture. So my interest lies mainly in that intersection between like in art, architecture and community and public engagement. Um, and that's, I got involved in this project because of Neil um, working with him on the People's Pavilion, which is on at Hill East at the moment. Uh, if you guys have found out about that, I'm sure there'll be uh, links in the chat below, but it's a design competition um, for young East Londoners um, to build a pavilion in Stratford, essentially. And yeah, Neil definitely brought a lot of us together. <laughs> Elias? Amazing, amazing. Let's uh, let's move on to um, Elias. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what, you, what you've been doing uh, for the past few weeks? Hey, I'm Elias Kawashi um, and uh, I... I'm a freelance multidisciplinary content creator. So that basically means I do everything and anything under the sun that has anything to do with uh, modern technology. So I film, I do photography, um, edit audio, I used to produce a bit of music. So literally anything and <laughs> anything that you need. Uh, I'm a part of the Lost Blocks Collective, a small collective of young people in the Woodward Farm Estate that's looking towards um, getting a lot of uh, events up and going and also change the narrative around the estate and the negative stigma. That picture right here is obviously one of mine, but this that's the beautiful estate. It's 80s vibes, so don't be mistaken. It's still as beautiful in person. Uh, graduated from university 2019, doing um, from the University of West London, uh, studying uh, music technology and radio broadcasting at the London College of Music campus. And since then, worked on a ton of small projects uh, I define myself as a, a podcast producer at heart, um, mainly because that's essentially the background, but obviously I'd like to get more, you know, build up my presence in that game. I uh, started a couple of small little podcasts from last minute thinking and plus and minus to last minute historians. I've uh, done a little bit of work with Represent Radio, a uh, community radio station down in Brixton. Awesome. You should definitely listen to it because it's better to support local than it is to I don't know, listen to Capital or whatever, but if that's your thing, mm -hmm. I think Represent is where you should go to for all the new and up-and-coming up talent for sure. I've worked with um, CDR, Create the Fine Release, who really give a platform for young um, music producers, house, techno, drum and bass, all of that. They host a monthly podcast, like live podcast, which is actually incredible, which I was a part of to record and help um, help push that project. And you. And if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can take your music down and listen to your music in a club environment. So you get that opportunity to really understand where the pitfalls in your music or if, if it just sounds great and it's ready for release. So that, it does definitely, definitely exciting. But if, um, if I look at everything that I'm doing in my life right now and you know we talk about our goals and end goals, my goal in the next five years is to be a documentary producer and to be one of the biggest in, in the world. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully in the next five years, you'll see something of mine on Netflix or Amazon, if, depending if I actually get the money from them. If not, you'll find it on YouTube. But I definitely wish to be the voice telling stories and you know spreading the truths and facts about African culture. Because uh, obviously starting with uh, Morocco, my motherland. So uh, I'd like to be that, I'd like to facilitate that storytelling um and yes yeah, part of my five-year plan so fingers crossed yes. like that. and uh, i think i've spoken enough so let's move on to the next one yeah that was amazing man and seriously the fact that a lot of people i'm sorry i know this isn't about the event but i just want to shine a light on that because a lot of people would say would have would have your goal and say oh no i can do that in 10 years 15 years five years isn't realistic but i think a lot of the time we underestimate what we can actually achieve in five years time so You've everything you're doing, everything everyone's doing, and the fact that you have that goal and you're not letting anything like, oh, I might not be ready or that's too quick. You're not letting that derail you or stop you. I have to commend you for that, bro. Big up to you, man. Now, last but certainly not least, for me, can you please tell everybody the amazing work that you're doing? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Fomer. 
I'm 19 years old and I'm a first year student at LSE studying politics and international relations. Um, aside from academics, I'm really interested in content creating. Um, so I have my own podcast that I um, co-host and we talk about issues related to politics, race, identity, media. Um, and yeah, that's a bit about me. Amazing, amazing. As you can see, a lot of people have been interested in podcasting. I'm going to touch on some of the reasons why our content actually turned into a podcast. And that's going to be something that we're looking forward to share with you. But before we discuss that, let's talk a little bit about the project. Now, we obviously were creating something to do with carbon, uh, net carbon zero. I wanted to first open open the floor up to everyone and ask you guys, what did you guys first think of net carbon zero? How aware were you about that? And what was your understanding at the time? And I'll leave, I'll leave anyone to, to jump in and, you know, I'll move around and ask you guys, or oh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I'd say for me, um, net, net zero, net carbon, you heard it a lot in the news. You heard like, you know, big promises by kind of like, just like the UK saying, oh, we're going to be net, net neutral or whatever by 2050 and I I didn't understand what the hell that meant I just thought that meant you know we'd do some extra recycling or we'd uh, end up producing reducing the amount of packaging we have on you know fruits and veg and maybe even on regular appliances so at first I thought it was just reducing uh, the amount of I don't know plastics in the world uh, reducing the amount of disposable um, items like we go through them quite a bit and I'm, I'm guilty as well of you know using disposable items I've got my my avian bottle here still but it's like it's it's quite you know that's what we think at first we just jump to that we don't really think of like factories or anything like that but that's what I, I thought in I knew a lot about like oh, not a lot but about carbon capturing technology and how obviously carbon gets kind of you know just kind of studying the carbon life cycle in, in school and whatnot but I don't think I think the statistics around actually the goals that we need to get to by a certain time and the amount of carbon that does go into the atmosphere or even Jonas like you were saying yourself because at the beginning of the project um Anna and the team made us all do our own kind of carbon footprint calculator um I'm sure some of you might think at some point you can calculate it for yourself but yeah, the kind of the statistics around how where we need to get to and how much carbon is we actually need to offset or reduce until we can actually get to net carbon zero is shocking. Well, man, what did you first think of net carbon zero? Were you familiar with the idea of it, or was that completely new to you when you know you received this brief to to get on with this project? Um, I would say that I was familiar with the term and like the concept, but um. I only knew like what I knew on the surface level, um, but through like the project, I guess I was able to understand that it was more than the visible, so like more than plastic um, pollution, and there was more to it um, in terms of like what's impacting the environment. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, just just to mention, if you guys want to calculate your own carbon footprint, we do have a link in the chat. So if you guys after 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 this event want to check it out for yourselves and see whether or not your foot carbon footprint aligns with what you think, then uh, feel free to do that. Now, for me personally, I knew that net carbon zero was to do with something around in the world. I knew it was to do with the environment, but you know, I heard the term when I was studying in GCC science. Um, didn't really think too much of it. I knew I had a role to play in you know how. Um, healthy we can keep keep the world and, and and reducing our net carbon zero but i never really knew much about it and that's one of the exciting things about this project is learning about it and that was part of that journey now i'm gonna hand it off to jonas jonas do you want to take us through you know what how we were approaching the project and uh, we can discuss it with the rest of the team yeah so the way we looked at it i feel personally in hindsight we were really looking and i'm not sure if everybody here has read the book the seven habits of highly effective people but i think habit two is begin with the end in mind so I think the way we approached it was we were thinking how do you want this to look in the end because that's how you get the most clear view from your objectives and aims on what you really want to achieve so as most of us said that we do podcasts and stuff like that but we're all content creators regardless I feel that we said that we wanted to do podcasts because this is I, I'm sorry if this is this sounds bad but I think podcasts aren't really difficult to make because if you can afford a, a good mic even if you can't when I started podcasting personally I was just recording it off of my computer into my phone using zoom which all costs for free and then I edited it on my own editing platform that Microsoft had ingrained in my computer 
So we said, okay, if we all have this common skill podcasting, it would actually make sense if we put that in here first. And then we thought to ourselves, how are we going to engage the public in these conversations? Because personally, I'm speaking for myself here. I see a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with this, but a lot of people go and do these public discussions, but it's about stuff like dark skins versus light skins, Nigerians versus Jamaicans, all this kind of stuff, right? So subconsciously in our mind, those things are actually creating divides in certain communities. And there's obviously other topics they talk about, but we thought to ourselves, how are we going to actually make impact? How are we going to go out there to the public while we're creating this content and say, okay, how are we going to engage everyday people that you potentially come across on the streets? So we said, oh, Voxbox would be a good idea for that. And actually, I wanted to say more, but Sharon's got a hand up. So yeah, I no, I, just, just to follow on from what you're saying really about that, because I think even just from what we've just said, the conversation that we were having beforehand, and I mean, until we kind of got involved in the project, we were obviously, we've been part of the project as content producers, not necessarily being, you know, employed as climate experts. We don't, we haven't necessarily no, we've all kind of come across it in our respective like feels like I've come across it definitely like in architecture but one thing that we ended up having was this really long discussion and a really great conversation about yeah it's like one of the first meetings we had where we were on call for about like an hour just discussing our own views on on climate and where where we personally stand with it and like a podcast for example just as a, as a medium just opens up that form of conversation I think that's not some it's rather than you know being thrown like having content or facts and figures thrown at you um it's just kind of visual content I think yet to almost be able to listen to a conversation or I, 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 that's how I felt I learned the most anyway is, is through that kind of, kind of that conversation um and I think we all thought kind of that podcast was a way to re authentically replicate that as well as then bringing in the other parts of um say like the vox pops which yeah I mean, you mentioned that you have your own like personal podcast as well. What kind of what kind of things do you think that you were able to to bring to the table with your expertise and your older background in, in podcasting? How did how did you know you kind of approach this project when we're going about recording a podcast? And I know, you, you know, you could tell us a little bit about how, you know, you actually ho hosting the podcast. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, that kind of approach, how you were taking it on and how you were bringing in that expertise to the table? Um, so I create podcasts with my friends, which is mostly like lighthearted conversations. And um, I saw as like an opportunity to, I guess, bring in like conversational skills into this project as the whole point of the Net Zero podcast was to basically talk about what Net Zero is to a younger audience and just to like debunk a few myths. So I guess the skills that I brought to this project was mostly like conversation um, and also like reaching out to people through messages. So in terms of the podcast, we were putting out a positive message and also an educational message at the same time. So I guess that's what I brought. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, sorry, Jonas, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, no, go ahead, Mishnah, actually. Were you going to make a point on that? Because I was just going to ask another question. So feel free to make a point. I mean, I was just going to mention, um, we're going to come back, we're going to come back to the podcast, but apart from the podcast, we also was talking about a, um, we also produced a, a Vox Pop interview, a series of interviews, because as much as it's important for us to have the discussion amongst ourselves and to talk about it, and obviously to talk about it to an already engaged audience, we thought it was important to also ask the general public and get an on-ground on response on what they thought net carbon was, zero was, how much they understood it, and how much they thought it affected their lives and the the impact that they thought they had so we're just gonna you know um Anna's just gonna present to you guys a little bit of the Vox Pop interviews that we did and uh, hopefully you guys can enjoy and um, we'll bring it back to that when it comes to climate change who's to blame the government for not informing us about what's going on it's took young children to shout and scream and say we need to stop all this so uh you know uh it's like anything else when you're young you're taught one thing unless someone tells you it's wrong you don't know it's it's wrong and years ago you had too many other things to worry about to worry about what's happening on the planet now we're realizing we won't have a planet the way we're going you know so yeah we've got to sit up and take notice the information is not going out to the right people. The pensioners need to be um, 
told more about it as well as the young people because we are willing to learn and we are willing to take part. The thing is our responsible about it because we need to uh, take all of things clean. If we do like that, everyone do like that, it's not, it's not, we are not going to have any global uh, pollution or those things. Yeah. So it's our, actually it's our responsibility. I, I'm coming from Venezuela mm. and uh, in, in my country we, um, I don't know, maybe because it's the, uh, like a third world country and we don't do too much rubbish than here. I think because everything, uh, when you buy something, you have the, the, the plastic, then the box, then the something that you, yeah, the lid. Yeah. yeah, and in my country, it's only the box I or just the plastic. A bit more resourceful at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Climate change, who do we blame? Us. Do you think about the impact that you have on the world? Do you think about those things or do you kind of just go on with your life? I think about it all the time because it's terrifying. Yeah? Yeah. What specifically is terrifying for you? Um, just the idea that maybe if, like, if I have kids one day, they might not, like, ever see snow or ever really see the world the way that we know it, and that scares me. So, like, these things are happening in the world right now. Who do you think is responsible for these things? Do you think it's us as human beings that were part of a society were, were the cause of it? Or do you think the government's not doing enough? Do you think corporations like Apple, Amazon, do you think they're responsible? Is it all of us? Is it everyone? To an extent, it's everyone, but mostly it's the government and it's big corporations. They create the most amount of pollution. They're the ones who could actually do something about it. Because as recycling and as like cutting down on meat is great, it makes a small difference, but we're not going to get anywhere without the government's actually changing le legislation and big corporations caring more about the world and people more than money. I think the issue is people they understand, they understand that global warming's a thing, they don't understand how bad it is and how little time we have to kind of change everything. Yeah. If we put it everywhere, more people would know. The London weather, I don't know why it's like this. Two, two minutes hot, two yeah. minutes raining, two minutes... Uh, I, I really, I, that's what I, mean, I need to know, I don't know. I don't, I don't need to know anything else. I just I need to know why the London weather changes a lot, that's it. I do think about the electricity, like... I think about like, sometimes how the cars gas and pollution and all that yeah and i know how like people throw things on the floor like cans and paper and all that yeah but like, i know that you have to recycle to like reuse it because it's a waste if you just throw in the bin yeah yeah, yeah and all that so do you, do you make the effort to try recycle things or do you just put it in any bin um i normally throw in the bin but sometimes i throw recycling but i don't think too much because i don't go out like, i don't throw my it's normally my parents that throw the bins outside and yeah, yeah yeah so like when you when you throw when you throw things, do you think about like what bin is gonna go in, or you just put it in any bin like it is what it is? Yeah, I do ask my parents like what what bin what what where should I throw it like which bin should I throw in? So you f you do you do think yeah, about these yeah, things? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you currently know about climate change so far? Like where do you currently stand in terms of how much you're aware of it? I understand that there's controversy, that many people argue that the planet's atmosphere is warming to a potentially irreversible level. Yeah. and that this warming is, I think the word is anthropogenic, caused by human activity. And then there's a whole bunch of other people going, oh, no, no, I don't believe that. No, no, that, that harms my profit. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't believe it. Yeah. Sorry, that sounds like I'm being a satirist, but it's basically a tussle between, you know, people who say that industry and extra, uh, mining and all, and all sorts of power stuff is, is actually harming our environment. And then there's other people who say, no, it isn't who tend to be industrious, but not always. What else do I know about it? Well, it's kind of a tough one, though, because there's a lot of um, quite puritanical stuff from the pro-climate preservation people yeah. in developed countries in the West saying to developing countries around the world, oh, no, you can't do what we did, which strikes me as a bit unfair. Yeah. If there's someone like, to blame for, for what's happening, who would you say he is? Government. Well, it's the government yeah. and this council, they need to do something about and the mayor as well. The mayor yeah. should do something as well, because they had so much time during the um, parliament and all that that's yeah. happening in the um, politics as well. Yeah. The politics should be doing something about it. Do you think? Do you think we're responsible for it though? We are responsible for it as well, but we are living in this generation. But they have the power of everything, so they should take over. Yeah. 
And if you had last question, if you had one question to know about climate change or what's happening around us, what would you ask? How will um, this impact the young people and what would you do to change it? Amazing. So you just saw right there the spectacular Shurin and the marvellous mission there in action for us. And for me personally, I feel that those Vox Pox were very, very insightful. And what I really want to ask you guys is, was there anything that surprised you about people's responses in those Vox Pox? And I want to start with Shurin, actually, since you're one of the people I went and did those box box. So was there anything right there that surprised you when you were out there? Like I don't know if I was that surprised, to be honest. I think it was a hot day in Stratford. And it, I was, to be fair, I was quite surprised in the amount of people that did want to talk to us. I think obviously lockdown has had a massive impact on people that I think you'd like Sue, uh, the lady at the beginning, she's very happy to talk to us. She's like, you know, would love to have these kind of conversations, any kind of conversation, because actually, you know, and a lot of people were saying how over lockdown that was something that I became more conscious of or realized you know how much waste they were throwing away just by living in their house um but yeah I mean it's a mixed bag of responses obviously people who didn't kind of want to be on camera but then the people who were people were engaged oh I, I don't think um there's one box box I don't think was in that um in that particular compilation but also you had we had some interviews where we asked them the questions and their their responses was like uh I don't know sorry <laughs> like, which is also just not yeah not surprising in any way I don't think it's a widely used term or a, a, as much of a conversation as it it probably um could be but I think we I hope we did a kind of good job in being able to sit down and just relate to people on you know talk about well not only like only their day but like you know what is it that they do breaking like obviously we went and approached different people in in different ways um and took the conversation to how they wanted to um, kind of take it like the guy that was like oh, I don't really know much and you know trying to also engage in I don't know not like goad them into the conversation but a lot of people were very kind of people like oh I don't know anything about this you know I can't talk about it and, it's, and we're like well that's the point we want to we want to know what it is that you do know what you don't know and that that's okay if you don't it's about the conversation and then at the end you know things that things or questions come out like, you know, why is, why is the London weather constantly changing? <laughs> Which is a really good question yes. in, like, in regards to climate, if you ask me. Because um, yeah, it's July, nearly. And <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's raining today and every, every so often it, it does rain. And, you know, sometimes we get caught up when we're living in London and get, living in the UK, we get used to the fact that it rains so often. And it's a, it's a running joke, isn't it? Every time you come to London, it's raining. Um, but how often do we actually question why it's happening and the kind of science behind why it's happening? And obviously, Sharon, you also mentioned the fact that a lot of people that we spoke to, you, yourself and I, we, you know, the ones that we saw in this video are the people that actually engaged. But there was a lot of people that weren't willing to engage or weren't willing to talk about it or were really confused. Or a lot of people actually didn't feel confident enough to, to speak about it. And even though that was the whole point for us to genuinely just get an idea of what you know, even if it's nothing, we still want to hear it. But people felt shy to even talk because of how little they knew about it. So I wanted to open up the floor to you guys. How much do you think the young people currently know about net zero and what's the kind of landscape like? Um, are they are they quite aware of it? Or are they familiar with it? Are they like us? Or do you think that they're you know very educated on the topic? What's it like as as young people as yourselves? What, what's the current landscape? I argue that we know more about recycling plastic or we think we know more about it than we do know about uh, carbon emissions and how that actually works and how net zero actually works because you know stuff like recycling we've been taught that since we were in primary school in nursery mm. you know put the bottles in the green bin with the stuff that can't be recycled in, in the normal bin but as for like net zero I don't think we truly understand what that means you know if uh, most of us have been to university here or have, are going to or whatever the plans is but we all know we all know those people that had to move into a new flat and had no furniture so they went they went down to ikea and they bought all of this furniture and then by the end of the end of the three years they end up throwing it out and what we don't realize is even if you put that into recycling is that desk that came from china had to be shipped all the way from from china took three days on a cargo ship all of, all of the fuel spent getting that there, all of the fuel spent making it, all of the fuel spent bringing it to your house, and you just don't think, oh wait a minute, that's a that's a lot of that's a lot of CO two emissions, or you don't think, oh wow, that's a 
that's a lot of carbon or we don't think about it when we go out and eat our food you know like the other day i saw australian beef in the store i was like whoa <laughs> why is our beef coming all the way from australia <laughs> think about how much like carbon is being emitted just getting that oh your beef alone is quite quite bad for you but cows alone you know they produce a like, ridiculous amount of gas <laughs> so it's like just yeah, think about something like that or something obviously um I think Bami did you cover that in the podcast which I know is jumping ahead a little bit but um editing some of that as well there was a kind of conversation around like the access to documentaries that we have now that are kind of like more well, like worldwide like sea spiracy cow spiracy um you know I, and I feel like I did spend probably quite a lot of lockdown watching a lot of documentaries and especially like especially ones regarding you know not just where our waste goes in the UK but globally how it's treated and where suffers you know the most there are you know literal rivers next to factories in you know across the world that you know are H&M factories for example that where all the microfibers end up in the water of the river and they tested you know, like local children's hair for microplastics mm -hmm. and it was all from they could trace it those compounds back to um the fabrics that were kind of leaking and had kind of bad practices uh, when it came to like disposal of waste and but it is it is so cyclical but it's it is one of those things that again yeah you kind of don't realize it really does affect every single part like yeah it's an ecosystem the world is an ecosystem at the end of the day but you can't it will just be you know it's just recycling and that's our bit even the one piece of like plastic like the hundreds packaging or something it's like this isn't recyclable but it's plastic no it's not the right type of plastic to recycle it's just yeah i can't sorry i think i went we off topic think, <laughs> think of like net zero or carbon we just don't think about carbon <laughs> you know no, it's, it's quite abstract though like as not abstract but unless you you're using those specific scientific or like biological terms it's not that language, uh, that scientific language isn't made accessible to everyone um, by any means. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. And for me, I want to bring you into this. So what's your opinions on what we've been talking about so, so far, especially in the last two, three minutes? Um, yeah, I agree. I'll say like, um, as a young person, I feel like we know what we've been taught in school and like what our parents tell us. Um, but in terms of like, like actively researching things along these lines, I guess that's where like people don't really understand what net zero is. So we understand plastic pollution um, and stuff related to that. Um, but like what Elise, Elise was saying about how like we go to like the supermarket and see like beef imported from Australia or from like um, other regions around the world. It's just like, understanding that there's more to it in terms of what net zero actually encapsulates and what it actually means as a definition yeah that's really interesting as well man you guys are bringing fire to this conversation and they're trying to say young people don't know stuff what they're trying to say young people like, don't know stuff maybe should we all give our like take or actually explain what net zero is to some maybe some people in the audience that don't know what it is so far because i feel like we keep talking about it but we haven't actually defined it yeah, that's that's really good actually. So sure, sure, and let's let's kick off with you actually. So how would you define it as 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 a entity pretty, of life? Pretty simply put, net means or translates to kind of like overall, right? As a kind of like prefix. But if you were looking to essentially like the whole concept of net carbon zero go reducing ourselves to net carbon zero emissions is to essentially come to a point where we're not putting out more carbon than we're able to capture or offset in other ways so you're able we're able to through various technologies and this might happen naturally carbon will be offset in things like rocks or the ocean they'll kind of take or like you know, through plants and trees um we can you know things like planting a tree would be a very natural good way of off offsetting carbon because you're you know for however much uh, co2 emissions you produce Kind of, I guess that like, make make up for it. I mean, these are very trying to use quite simple terms, but um, yes, there's different ways of offsetting it. But until we kind of reach this net zero, where we're not producing more than we can also take away, because currently we're still 
that that balances yeah but there's you know the uk all kind of western powers or countries in the world who offset a lot more carbon than say um countries in south america who have the most rainforests but are then kind of responsible for offsetting like on a on a worldwide scale anyway uh, i mean i'm no i'm no climate scientist by any means but and oh then also this can also it's also mainly those those countries where ecosystems are quite fragile that will feel the effects of it more so than us in our kind of you know blocks. let me hear you guys with a you know controversial view on what is net zero because you do find it quite lotion but i'd argue that net zero is choosing your demons <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why using your demons because you think like, i'm not going to eat meat so that's going to reduce the amount of carbon i produce right but you then you know drive everywhere <laughs> in your petrol car so then you ask the question like is driving that petrol car like as as bad as eating meat or when you think about countries and we you know you, you brought up an interesting point of like south south america you know chopping down the trees it's it's interesting because like a lot of western world has gone through the industrial revolution already whereas a lot of other countries are still getting through it and they're you know starting off their own industrial revolutions and building their economy yeah and so well that's that's John was saying in the podcast, right? Uh, in the Vox Pop, sorry. Um, yeah, the kind of uh, the chat at the end that was saying so it's all a bit, you know, uh, the Western countries imposing rules of power. Sorry, just elaborating what you're saying. On other countries are saying you can't have an industrial revolution because that's bad for the planet well, because we've already, already made that damage, which, yes, yeah, true. Like environmentally, you can't afford it, but also the power dynamics that come into that. And also, sorry, also to follow on from that. Um, I completely agree with you, but then again, it comes down to that question of, is that an individual responsibility or, or who's, again, like the, the question, one of our questions that we ask is climate change, who's to blame? Is that, you know, is it, if it comes down to those choices, obviously like the, in terms of like carbon, the amount of carbon that is produced, the kind of, the amount of carbon that's on the individual, your individual consumption, is it, you know, is your philosophy, do you reduce your own personal footprint or do you lobby for, for change for, you know, a lot of people, you know, in the in the, those rock pops blamed it on, you know, the government or the government policies. Or is it is it basically the question being, is it an individual responsibility or a collective responsibility or both? Or like you answer it, it's both. I'd argue it's both. At the end of the day, it's like you can try so hard to reduce your own, but if you're in a group of like say you've got nine other friends and none of them do anything, you feel like it's not doing anything. Obviously you can lobby with uh, like, you know, the current government or local government and get petitions done so that you can actually help curve it in a way, but it's not to feel, you don't want to feel too pessimistic about it either. So we, we as young people have to be optimistic and make those small changes. You know, they've, you know, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, recycling was like a, a myth. Now it's a lot, you know, it's possible. We're doing a lot about it. And just to bring up one point, uh, an interesting point. I always hear this point brought up when people say we plant more trees. One interesting fact I found is that even when we plant that tree and it absorbs all of that carbon, as soon as we chop that tree down, all of that carbon is then released again. <laughs> so in the long term of things, we've got to find solutions now. And if we're going to assist the countries that are going through the industrial revolutions, we've got to be able to make those technologies affordable to those countries as well. Because it's all good, high and mighty, us sitting in, you know, in, in a Western country, in a first world country saying, yeah, I reduce the amount of plastic I use, or I reduce the amount of CO2 emissions I use, and, and, what, and, and, and I'm doing my best. But then you almost feel like a little bit, a little bit deflated when you see the other half of the world just <laughs> not really responding. In, yeah. the, in the same way yeah that, that totally makes sense and it's very interesting to hear you guys kind of definitions and and talking a little bit about um you know who's you know who's who's to blame now for me i know you or you led a discussion to do with a podcast and asking that very question of car net carbon zero or carbon you know you know, when it comes to climate change 
who's to blame for all of this now do you want to talk us through the kind of firstly the the approach and how you went about you know preparing for this kind of question and you had some guests also and you know you you were going about hosting it do you want to do you want to walk us through that approach first and then leading on to um the kind of discussions and the the conversations that came out of that podcast well how did the how did the guests respond what did they say um so in terms of finding guests I feel like it was quite hard um, and I had to be quite like tactical about who I reached out to. So I remember at first I was reaching out to people that had like big followings on Instagram or different social media pages. But um, in terms of like the responses I was getting, it was mostly like you had to like pay them to um, talk on these platforms or there had to be some sort of commission and they weren't like willing to actually come into the podcast without any type of like payment um and then um I had to like change my strategy and look at people within my network and people locally as well so that's how I was able to get the free guests um onto the podcast so we had Michael from Little Spoons who I knew personally um so I was able to reach out to him and then Seda from Finn and Earth which was a plastic free um, lifestyle store in Hackney which is within East London so locally to where I live as well and then Giuseppe who also like um, was in our personal network who knows Neil um, and I guess like reaching out to these people they had to like fall within a certain category of people who um, were implementing net zero within their own businesses or their like everyday lives as well because they had those like expertise and knowledge and that's what was needed with, on the podcast Amazing. And um, just for you guys uh, watching, I want to give you guys a bit of context of, of the actual um, of, of the of the podcast. So we're going to just play a reel just to show you guys some of the some of those kind of conversations. And then we'll jump back to for to talk us a little bit more about that. What is net zero and how would you explain how would you explain net zero to someone who doesn't know what it is you've got to reduce the our emissions as much as possible until they're so low that you can in theory i suppose the idea is that you then offset that through carbon capture but with trees or other technologies um as confusing as the whole thing sounds it's balancing the amount of green house greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere and amount removed from the atmosphere and um, we're currently living so fast and we rely so much on fossil fuels um, we need to make drastic changes and um, this could be done by lowering our emissions and planting more trees switching to clean energy and reducing our waste and just protecting our environment at what point do we not become sort of a burden in addition to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere at what point is it net not adding um, yeah, and you just, like you say, you've got two parts to that. You've got the reduction part, but then also we can't not emit any carbon. We're sort of human beings, we're sort of going about our daily life. You can start to offset it through various things like tree planting, for example. Do you feel like it's right that people should be angry towards these big corporations and government? Ultimately, yes but fundamentally it's human nature. What's made us so successful as a biological species is we're quite a selfish animal. So it's in our DNA to, to have this sort of behavior, but now we've developed this sort of consciousness um, and ethics where we're in a situation where we should be able to override it. And sadly, I think, you know, that twinned with capitalism and greed has led big corporations with no choice but to go down that path. My argument would say it's kind of not people's fault because it's their fundamental nature. So does that mean that, that, that governments are to blame? I would say so. I think they have a responsibility. Um, people ultimately drive the, that decision by sort of voting in who they want. So we've all got a collective power, right? I wonder whether it's easier to, to kind of uh, vote and, and argue for for change by the sort of big corporations or governments or whatever than it is to make 
those decisions yourself. What are the biggest problems facing the environment? Well, where to start? What are the problems <laughs> facing the environment? You know, biodiversity loss, deforestation, plastic in our oceans, you know, warming, frozen, I don't know, frozen air, uh, ice. What am I trying to say? Melting ice caps. <laughs> <laughs> That's the words. Uh, yeah, I don't know which is more prevalent, but they all seem pretty bad. Yeah, I had those listed in my <laughs> mind as well. <laughs> so many. So you, yeah, I don't think you can necessarily put one on it, but what you can start to do is say, where does this lead? This leads to, again, how do you get people to start thinking about change? It's going to affect me, ultimately. What's the biggest problem is that there's going to be um, a real humanitarian crisis that's going to come out of this. Whether it's you know drought, flooding, mass migration, so many people in the world at that time anyway. So all of them together create one very bad problem for us and our survival really. And that ladies and gentlemen was a bit of our podcast. Now don't forget that there will be links in the in the chat for you guys to watch after this event for you guys to, to enjoy the content that we've we're producing, get more of an understanding. Now um, and also we've also got a chat feature and a QA feature for you guys to ask questions. I can see there's already a couple of questions in there. Um, if you are you know hearing this discussion or you're watching these videos and you're thinking I've got something to ask either some of us or you want to know something then feel free to to put that into the q a now i'm going to turn back to for me for me um you know you, you were asking you know these individuals who seem to be you know experts in, in net carbon zero or at least have some idea of it how do you think we can get more people that don't usually engage in these kind of discussions that aren't talking about net carbon zero other than experts how do we bring more people to talk about these things and get them engaged um i would say just having conversations like whether that be um, a conversation where you're sharing what you know or just talking about talking it out whether like you're addressing some of the myths or some of like the crazy things that they've heard because even when I was talking to these guests um, I didn't really know much about net zero beyond what I've read or what I've seen or heard from like my friends or from different outlets but talking to them it also like Got the conversation going and it also like educated me in the long run as well um through them providing their own knowledge so i guess conversations is where it starts and that's where you get to keep the um topic rolling from here to there and like to different people yeah and you talk about kind of having conversations and speaking to people do you guys do you think that was kind of one of the main approaches when it came to deciding right we want to have a podcast because it's important to hold these conversations, hold these discussions. And podcast is one of those beautiful um, platforms that allow other people to kind of eavesdrop on other people's conversations. And whilst you're listening to a podcast, you're not actually talking, but you are still hearing those conversations and getting those ideas and concepts into people's ears. Do you guys think that that was one of the main reasons for why we chose to, to do a podcast? Definitely. Mm. Definitely. Go first or do you want me to uh, anyone go ahead yeah well i'd say i'd say like you said you know a podcast is more prevalent in our culture today than it was uh, you know five years ago you know we spent all our time in the quarantine so we needed something to entertain ourselves uh, and it seems almost blasphemous that something that follows a similar format to radio which is on its on its last legs has found its way into the mainstream with young people like podcasts and that's the main thing you you hit the nail on the, on, on the head there it's a conversation and people are always interested to hear what others have to say other professionals or those entrepreneurs who started their own businesses to make that change and just hearing about it and seeing people do it will probably encourage them to try and do it themselves uh but i'm sure you guys all remember when we first started this this project uh, i i always i felt that the best way to spread the story is through one or two things. It's either a conversation or telling a story. 
which which is like when when we started off it was like either a documentary or it was going to be a podcast and both of those especially over the last year we've had are both very powerful tools to use to really explain what net zero is and for us to start that conversation and really dive into it and hopefully in the next 20 years they'll be having another conversation trying to figure out how to deal with the next problem we would have done such a good job Shirin what did you think no absolutely I just want to like I'm just excited for the podcast to come out now (laughs) it's um I think still currently in production but should be getting I don't can't yeah no I'm sending around an email (laughs) when it does get released so keep your eyes peeled even after this event we've got a lot more content kind of coming out beyond this um but yeah this event kind of just to reflect on that process and how we've been finding it so far which I do think as well what is important or a good way to engage people is through I think even like do a field of Craig Bradley Studios actually setting aside you know a, a budget and a project to actually engage with young people who will then and teach them about it for one and um kind of yeah have a, have a project centered or focused around something like the installation that you can kind of see behind me which you can still see um as part of the London Festival of Architecture um but to actually open up and have those conversations which I think yeah you know the more now that they've kind of given us that opportunity to and brought us together to speak about it we're here you know talking on an online panel um hopefully maybe other people will take something that they've learned from this and have that hold that in conversation the next time they talk and I know that I'll definitely be bringing this up a lot more in conversation and it's I think when you start when you learn vocabulary for certain topics like this you feel like yeah you're able to talk about them more so I feel like now I feel a lot more confident to be able to go out and speak to my friends and tell them you know this is what net carbon zero means and this these are the conversations that we should be having and I don't know yeah I, it's it's completely a, a dominant effect I think yeah, and talking of content to come, uh, Sharon, you've been you know producing a, a, z- a zine, and and that's yet to to be published. And obviously, I know Jonas has been working on some social media content as well. Sharon, do you want to just talk us, just give us a bit of a hint and a, and an idea of what's to come? And obviously, all the content we produce, just a reminder, it's going to be in the link in our chat. And uh, there's obviously more content to continue, so keep an eye out on that link and you know update it in, in in a few weeks' time, and you'll see even more content coming out. So, Sharon, do you want to walk us through a little bit about that? that uh, that you were making and um, what's to come yeah Yeah, so um I guess my my background is more definitely in the visual kind of arts or graphics um do yeah a bit of like freelance graphic design and I've always yeah I had had a few few experiences of making zines but I think when we first got given the brief it was very much um I don't know I don't know, because at that point, whether we were working collectively on one whole project together or if we were all splitting up and kind of doing our own tasks and coming from, as well, an architectural background, one thing that, you know, say it kind of started off with something else at first. It was, I was thinking about maybe also doing kind of an informative resource for um, architecture students or like, that is one thing that I know that we definitely come across within architectural education is, you know, sustainability and, local material sourcing etc um but I don't think because it's such a, a kind of self-led course there's not a set and because obviously all the legislation and everything is constantly changing um we've never had like I don't know one thing I've just missed is kind of like a set kind of teaching on you know this is what net carbon is and relating the environment specifically and, and understanding those concepts to the built environment and making you know I mean there are a lot of resources out there now which I've been informed by now through um kind of Anna but kind of making that information a bit more accessible but also in like a visual sense so the zine is essentially um documenting parts of uh the projects that we've done so far some some kind of quotes of the vox pops and putting those conversations out um as well as parts of the uh podcast interview kind of in, in a written form but as well as that we've got um statistics facts figures um and then like a kind of climate dictionary with um a, a bunch of yeah definitions for some of these kind of pop-up words that you hear hear all the time like you know 1.5 degrees what does what does that mean where does that come from um and 2050 where does number 2050 come from so 2050 is the year by which we need to have all our carbon emissions 
below net zero in order for our planet to not heat up to or over 1.5 degrees Celsius, because that's when things like ma major, you know, disasters will happen, I think. And the statistic is by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So a bunch of kind of fact statistics and also helpful links and uh, kind of wayfinders for you to um, potentially you know, could help you consider your decisions or find out more information about how you can get involved in things that you can do um, on an individual level anyway, um, or even, yeah, organizations that you might want to think of be a part of to help you on your journey to reduce your net carbon zero, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah. I know that's, I've been thinking about that a lot. Yeah, that's that true. One, but... <laughs> yeah, true. I think that's crazy. What you just said there, Shireen, is crazy. By 2050, there'll be more yeah. plastic in the ocean than fish. That's why I don't eat fish anymore, guys. <laughs> it's mad, though, isn't it? It's mad. I think, I'm sorry, I, I need to mention this, but I remember when Happy Feet was the second film I ever watched in cinema, right? Second film, right? This film, I remember the key, it's about, obviously, mumbles of tap dancing penguin. That's what it's mainly about, right? But there's other elements within that film. And something that I always remember is, I don't know, has anyone here watched the film as well? Just a gauge. Cool, yeah. Do you guys remember that penguin who had, you know those people when you get a bunch of beer, right, and it's in that plastic thing, throw it together. There was a penguin with it around its neck. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Stuff like that is generally happening to our animals. I thought you were generally was the overfishing that. around the Antarctic and the amount of consumption of fish that we have in the world right now is actually out of control. Especially, mm. especially I think... I think it's especially in, in the West, in Europe, and uh, America and China, it's like we're, they, we probably eat more fish than there is fish going to be left. Mm, yeah, man. <laughs> and we're destroying habitats on a daily basis. You know, the coral has no time to recover. And we always underestimate how much, you know, how much carbon that the sea actually absorbs. When you think about all of that coral, all of the seaweed, everything under there, all that life, it's absorbing quite a bit of CO2 yeah, <laughs> as well. I think... Yeah. sorry sorry i'm just just thinking about that it really does it is it's kind of the mindset as well that you have or the attitude that you have towards it. it's quite a short short-sighted attitude right that obviously we can blame it on generations before us and we might you know not be able to blame it. it's kind of like sue said in the vox pops it's like you think about you know just getting by and i think even in the vox pops interviews people were thinking we're talking about well you know i'm just, trying to, I'm just living my life it's not something that's really on my mind or like something i really think about because I've got so much else going on like why should why should I care why should it concern me like there's only so much kind of time and it is it does really I think take switching your mind and I, I think it's difficult to always and I guess like where Jonas like you said it becomes like you know a, ha a habitual thing that maybe you need to build up mm. um, but to sometimes take yourself out and think of think of things long term and actually yeah have that sorry care and consideration for you know actually like the long-term and sustainable systems that are I don't know in my ethics maybe just a little bit you know moving away from capitalism a little bit and realizing that you know waste isn't helping anyone it's destroying our planet or just some you know policies like not being able to throw away uh not being able to you know give food away like you have to throw it away because it's past the sell by date or it's not like goods rather than you know actually feeding people who need it no like those kind of nonsensical things and lobbying well, for, an interesting point there because it's something i always think about uh and this is something that a lot of companies have spent a lot of money uh promoting they they, they a lot of companies out there make it our responsibility like uh, there used to be these old coca-cola ads and stuff like that where they would like don't pollute don't throw your rubbish or whatever like that even though they're the biggest producers of plastic waste and it's almost shifting the responsibility of who's who should be the one to take that final responsibility when if all of these companies and institutions turn around and write all right let's invest a ton of money and actually get you know find a way to you know either be carbon neutral or even waste neutral if that's even possible for them then maybe the blame would stop being shifted towards us and it will be more of a joint collective as we're working together because there's no way we can ever live in a world without capitalism you know everyone needs profit but if there's a, a, that, a bit of symbiotic that relationship at the same time though because as well it's like kind of like 
you know, going all econ bro, but like supply and demand at the same time, if us as consumers don't push for that shift in, you know, at the end, it's like one of the biggest things at the moment is you know, constantly is what, you know, market insights and consumer insights, what is it that we want? And if we openly say, and like there's so many things in that, you know, we collectively do have power that we have pushed to say, you know, we won't stand for it, we don't, we don't, we're not gonna buy from you. We're gonna boycott you if you don't, you know, can like consider our demands and actually say we want sustainable things. We like buying local and supporting independent or, you know, like pushing for companies at least to, even in like little things like, like I don't know, I do think, yeah, it's a bit of both, sorry. Yeah, but I'd also argue trying isn't enough, you know, because you get companies that will be like, oh, well, okay, we're gonna do this, but then they never fulfill that promise. Yeah, I'm sure we're all sick and tired of hearing companies going, oh, by 2020, we're going to like, oh, this is 2021 now, oh, 2020, we're going to be this, and they're not that, like, then who do you blame? <laughs> is it still our fault? So it's like, we can't, like, there are some companies that are just too big to boycott. Like, you know, you go for a bottle of water and you don't realise it's being produced by Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, like, how how do you stop a juggernaut, how do you stop juggernauts like that from, you know, shifting the blame of, of like the, the shifting the blame, and I, th I think that's one thing we need to figure out as a generation uh, to stop them from shifting that brain, uh, that blame, and like you said, shop local. You know, go go visit these new stores that are popping up where you come in with your own old containers, and you fill it up with rice or whatever grain that you need, and you know, shifts more to buying local and treat, treating the world like it's our it's our bedroom. Really, no one likes a dirty bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true, man. That's true. We just had fire and amazing value coming from the panelists. Thank you. But it's not over yet because right now we're going to turn to all of you who have been watching this amazing show so far. So as we said in the chat, feel free to put your questions down right now. But the first question I'm going to go to is from Simon Branson. And the question is, and for me, I want to come to you first on this. Would you change your habits if companies had informed you how much CO2 was in the production of and distribution of goods? Um, yeah, definitely, because I feel like if companies are providing me with that information, like let's say I go into Tesco and um, like on a packet of like meat, there's like how much carbon emission it took to transport this like um package of meat, I guess I would be more aware and more cautious of where I put my money and my spending habits as well. So I guess like my answer is yes, um, because if I know I can do my own little bit to um, protect the environment, I guess I would take that um, step, so yeah. Yeah, and Ellis, you also talked about you know, how you can walk into a shop and get a bottle of water and not even know that it's being produced by coca-cola for example or you know you, you know it's a it's a lot for us to take on these kind of companies and like you so rightly mentioned it's, it's a question we need to answer as a generation now simon's question about whether companies informing us about uh co2 and whether that's going to in inform our decisions do you think that that will be the case if they were to tell us about the production and distribution of goods if that was something that were they were transparent about would that change your, would that change your habit I'd, I'd say it goes back to that point of what I made earlier. It's choosing your demons, isn't it? If you're if you're in a, in a moment of desperation, and you need a bottle of water. You're just you're going to buy that bottle of water. It doesn't matter the cost to the world. Or if you need certain products, like, you know, you need a new computer. You're going to go right. I need a new computer, and I need it now. <laughs> if if it means you have to wait a week for it to be repaired, or a month, or however long. So for me, in, it depends in the moment. If in, the, in that moment, I'm like, yeah, okay, I could be conscious about this. I'll be conscious about it. But if I can't, if I can't be conscious about it in that moment, it, I just, you just, you, you try, you know, and you just kind of, you have no choice. I think it's difficult to sometimes, I don't know, might be like, not a bit like off track, but to make the point that I'm going to make this kind of, um, ethical experiment that you know if you see somebody drowning in front of you you're you know of course you, you're so much more likely to go in and jump in and help them whereas like you know how ethically obligated are you to help somebody and you know and save save them from drowning if you know that they're 
somebody's driving but it's, it's 20 minutes down the road and you're in a nice new suit and da, 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 da. like it's the, the kind of the, di the distance that you have between you know your kind of um oh, sorry I don't know why that's going off right now um the distance that you have between the choices that you need to make essentially it's really difficult to keep in mind when you're buying these things at your convenience or you know you've got your needs that you obviously are prioritizing at the ex like to think about the expense of like of who those things and those commodities are coming and it is a very kind of you know our brains aren't necessarily wired to think in that way and things like you know having kind of carbon labels or having those conversations a lot more in the forefront would or like help us to think about it more so on, a, on an everyday basis I think yeah that's what I'm trying to say um but it's hard it's hard yeah Thanks for that, Shirin. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has a, a WhatsApp opened on on their things, then you know, if you could meet that, that would be great. So we can hear everyone. Um, another question that came in from uh, Fliss is, how do you think we can get young people excited? What role does social media play? So it's a very interesting question. You know, we we talked about how in the podcast we were talking to kind of experts in, in that field and um, a lot of people that engage in the conversation surrounding climate change. I know if I were to ask the when when Shirin, when we were asking, Asking the general public about climate change, a lot of people actually turned around and weren't willing to engage. A lot of people were bored. You know, how do we get young people to talk about it? I know someone in in, in the um, in the Vox Pop interviews, which you guys will be able to watch when you click in the link in the chat. And um, someone mentioned about kind of keep talking about it, bombard people about it. Is that the approach? Sure, and do you, do you, do you think to get people engaged in in this discussion? Um. I think actually it's funny that you asked that because also there's a, another question in the q and I'm just seeing now by Karen where uh, she says she asks do you think schools or educational institutions have a role to play in raising this awareness and that was that would essentially be my answer is yes um, in relation to also yeah to your question is I think it does come from um, an education from young but also kind of continuous channels of communication between I also think partly to do with government I mean again kind of sidetrack but also the way that you know government information has been disseminated to the public via COVID pandemic that's you know it's been it's shown us I mean as, as wayward as that has been as well in itself um again it, we will go through different channels of like media to 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 understand those things but it's also shown that it can be done and you know if there are you know policy changes or big decisions like okay now we start so like how, how does how does that information get from you know government to, to the public anyway like the everyday person doesn't look at policy changes or you know I don't think the amount of things that we can recycle has changed in however many years whereas you know in Japan it's they have have to recycle everything in 16 different ways and you have to do it all at home like and it's very much a cultural uh, thing as well I think but I do think that education should come early and be kind of I don't know at least yeah have channels of communication like media that we know that we are reliable that we can go to for for, for updates I think that's that's I'm still trying to figure that one out as well I think yeah and I think Simon's question quite nicely leads on to Karen's question you also mentioned as well and um, I just wanted to talk about my personal experience when it came to to schools and universities talking about climate change because that is something that Karen did ask I feel as though when I was in school and we talked about climate change it was in a it was in a classroom environment environment sometimes it was from a scientific perspective when we we're learning about it that's how I learned about it but if it was in like a type of PSHE type of format a lot of the times it was a it wasn't a conversation it was a talking at uh, the students kind of telling them in sometimes informing but a lot of the times it was teachers speaking at the students and I think that's one of the problems is one of the things that I believe in is that the teacher and student relationship, it should have more flexibility in holding discussions and holding debates. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the times we suppress students from having opinions and having voices in schools because we think that, you know, obviously we might get in trouble for, for voicing our opinions, but those are the things that we need to talk about. And those are the things that we need to get out. We need to get more students and more young people you know, even asking things that, you know, you, you wouldn't expect from them because that's how we develop and how we how we learn and even making comments that, you know, might not be the best comments. But again, it's about debunking and understanding 
where people are coming from and even if someone says something wrong it's an opportunity to be corrected and I think you know facilitating more of a discussion allowing it to be a conversation in schools and promoting debates and differences and ideas is one of the ways that we can actually get young people to talk about these discussions without feeling like they're going to be suppressed without feeling like their voices are going to be affected or whether or not their credibility is going to be affected or not and that's one of the things that we really wanted to get across we of our podcast is giving us as your know, as content producers the freedom and the opportunity to create content in a way that we wanted to and that's one of the amazing things that you know um you know fcv and um, uh, beyond the box have allowed us to do is not prescribing how it should be done and telling us you know when it came to the podcasting and when it came to the zine and the vox pop interviews these are ideas that came from us as a panel and came from us as content producers we weren't told to do these things because it's important that young people are behind the decisions that are being made if it's targeting young Young people. So on that point, I wanted to uh, bring it to you, Ellis. How do you think that, you know, we can get more people engaged? Do you think it's also about having those conversations or is there another way that we can go about this? Uh, to that question earlier about social media and, and, and schools yeah. and place it plays, just to bring that up again, it's, it's, it's what one thing we need to think about is how, how do we make this stuff a habit? How do you make you know, recycling a habit. How do we make net zero being conscious about your net carbon a habit? And this 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 reminds me of a TikTok I saw not too long ago. And the question was, is what looks cool if you're rich, but uh, like bad if you're poor? And the response was sustainability, which is is like really interesting because like for like a lot of rich people, they're wearing you know like you see Kanye West wearing uh, a hoodie that was you know, worth 1,500 pounds or something ridiculous like that, but it's all ripped up and stuff like that. But you see someone who might not have the same value as Kanye and see him with the ripped up top and you think, ah, oh, he's homeless or he's this or he's that. So we obviously need to find that middle ground and a way of like respecting res respecting it and making it more popular with young people. Because if you don't make something popular with young people, they're not going to do it. We're seeing it a lot with clothes and, you know, vintage, you know, we see people wearing like 80s and 90s vibes, 70s vibes. But then we see corporations jump along at H&M and make vintage clothes. So it's like, it's, 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 it's you know, we're trying to resolve this problem ourselves, but then big companies come along and see, ah, I can see profit to be made here. So I, I think to really get young people through social media, it's making it a cool thing, making it a cool habit. And that's the only way we're going to get fruits to, to our generation and the generation coming up. Because they like following trends. You make it a trend. Quite pessimistic that that's what all that it is that we want to do. But I know what you're saying is I think there's varying levels of engagement across our like age group. But I think as well, acknowledging the levels of access and the, the hindrances that certain demographics or like people might have to be able to access those conversations because again it's like even this isn't quite you know a complete like slander I like I don't know if anybody's been seeing or keeping up with the recent um, extinction rebellion protests in London which obviously aren't reported on very much so at the moment but also you know the kind of majority um, unsurprisingly I think because of obviously like the demographic of the UK but it's very much more kind of seen as a white or middle class movement um and you know people like there's there's so many kind of intersectional conversations that you can have with this as to why certain people are left out from that conversation you know who like it but that's that i think that the only way that we're gonna you know genuinely be able to make change and reach people is if yeah if it is popular or if it's you know that information is, is made accessible to the right to, to everybody and understanding those boundaries between like as to why certain people might not engage with that conversation at all um, 100 yeah 100 percent. we've got just under 10, 10 minutes to to wrap up and we will get kind of bring things to a close but um we just we, we've got two quick questions we wanted to to ask so do you want to quickly talk uh, talk us through the questions that we've got got in from daniela and nabila about you know companies and the communications surrounding that and then we'll wrap up of course of course so guys one of the final questions that we have, one of the final questions we have is from Daniela. Thank you for your question, Daniela. And the question is, how do you think that the recent changes by companies have been in order to reduce carbon emissions, for example, electric cars and stuff like that? So for me, I want to come to you first. 
What's your opinion on this? Um, I would say recently companies have been um, making efforts to actually like tackle um, carbon emissions. And um, I feel like them being in the limelight has also been beneficial, um, showing that they're making progress and also encouraging us as consumers to make changes in our everyday lives. Um, like with the push for electric cars, I guess um, you can see like a change in how people are also like shopping and what they're shopping for in terms of vehicles and how they're using transport too. So I guess um, them taking accountability and responsibility is, um, is like something that is good and is the way forward as well. Yeah, and uh, just just to kind of uh, to bounce off of that, um, Shirin, you know, one of the questions that Nabila was asking about this is: is there is there a conversation happening between big companies and the youth, you know, so surrounding what they're doing to be more co co corporate social around corporate social responsibility? Uh, is that kind of conversation happening? And um, you know, is, is that something that if it's not happening, we could get a protest or a petition going? I I've been actually having it started to have a look around that for the the zine as well as to you know how is it that you can actually get involved or what what is that channel of communication I haven't found like a particular or like a one kind of go-to in any way I think there's a lot of kind of local actions um I think it takes sometimes a bit of like a google like you know what part of London or like the UK kind of green or like, like Facebook groups and things um, or writing to those companies yourselves but it is it, I think that's a really good point I think there is so much still to be done um, different societies I know with, with existing with people a lot of people that I know are, that go to different unis um, and so there are I think little pockets of people organizing but um, I, I genuinely I think yeah that's a really good question and I don't know, maybe, maybe that like following on from this, that we could like, it depends I don't, who, who it is that you've got in mind that you wanna kind of target or contact, but um, local action and rallying people together, I really think is the way forward. So yeah, I mean, let's talk about it. <laughs> Fantastic question from Nabila. And if you guys wanna continue kind of this conversation and you wanna kind of get, get more involved or speak to us about it or do something, maybe start a petition, then obviously make sure you head over to the website that we've got in the chat about what is net zero and you can find a link to that. And um, feel free to get in touch with us or get in contact with uh, Phil and Clegg Bradley Studios or even Beyond the Box. And, you know, we can continue this. And uh, obviously there's, always, there's gonna be content available there for you guys to watch the podcast that we talked about as well as you know the vox pop in interviews as well as well as the the zine that was created by shirin do you want to wrap it up yes but i'm going to be real you right now i know i came in all energetic at first but i'm just going to say right now that the last 90 minutes i didn't think that i'd be energized because i've had a long day i was in school i was in a school all day woke up early and i was tired by the end of the day but this is just what my energy right back up now so everybody on this panel thank you so much for coming down to this event my co-host my amazing co-host mission you smashed it bro thank you to you thank you to all the amazing panelists thank you to everybody in attendance and everybody for the questions also and now i really want to actually just thank some people that are behind the scenes right now but i personally feel we need to shine a light on and the first one is neil and i'm not sure if he's still here but i'm gonna say it regardless and i might get a slap on the wrist for saying this but I just want you guys to understand the humility of this man because he didn't get paid for any of this. He's been helping us through this program and through us creating content with his business, but he hasn't got a single penny in his pocket for this. He said, I want the young people to lead on this and I want them to be paid for it. He could have been selfish and said, you know what, just give me a little 10%, give me a little 15%. He said, no, nothing. The young people deserve the money. So I think we should all, as panelists, just... Unmute if you're muted already and just give Neil a round of applause because I think he deserves it personally, guys. Just me, that's just my opinion about it. And now I also want to thank Anna, who's actually been aiding us through this process as well and has given us this platform because a lot of people wouldn't trust in young people to be speaking about things like this. And they wouldn't believe that we'd be able to have the conversations that we have today because each and every single one of you brought tremendous value to this event. 
And I must say, I'm just honored, privileged. And to be honest, to use a slang word because I speak two languages, English and slang. To use a slang word, I'm gassed right now, which means for people that don't know that, I'm really, really happy and excited about this and what the future holds for our generation. So Anna, thank you so much for allowing us to have this platform, allowing us to do this event. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed it thoroughly. Now, we've got some closing slides as well. And I mission, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add either. Oh, I just, oh, you honestly just said everything, you took the words out of my mouth. Thank you for everyone in attendance. We how much of a big issue this is, and it's not just the UK, it's an international global issue, and it's something that we want to make sure that we continue after this event. And like I mentioned so 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 often, the everything's are going to be available, and you guys can continue watching and engaging in the this. And let this be an opportunity for us to talk about climate change. This is, this is an issue that uh, all of us, regardless of whether we like it or not. So yeah, um, let's just go to the closing slides. But thank you so much for everyone in attendance. It was a pleasure speaking to you all. Thank you to the panel pa panelists. And uh, yeah, have a, have a lovely evening. Take care, thank everyone.